I wanted a place for people to receive authentic guidance and practical ways to awaken. Thought-provoking, paradigm-shifting, and empowering. This is about expanding our human consciousness to create a wave of new possibilities. I'm Dr. Teresa willard White, and this is Quantum Minds TV. Welcome to Quantum Minds TV, where we take a deep dive into various perspectives on what it's going to take to create a shift in human consciousness. Now, today, I'm thrilled to have Nassim Haramine joining me. Nassim is a world leader in physics and the founder of the Resonance Science Foundation, the Resonance Academy, Taurus Tech, and Art Crystal. He spent more than 30 years researching and discovering connections physics, mathematics, geometry, cosmology, quantum mechanics, biology and chemistry, as well as anthropology and archaeology. And Asim Hermine and his team of researchers have taken a very innovative approach to developing a formal unified view of physics using a combination of the holographic principle, quantizing space-time, and identifying the actual geometry of space-time itself. So, Nassim, I believe that you and I first met back in 2009 at the International Alchemy Conference in Los Angeles, and I was struck by a few things I just like to say at a personal level uh, about you, because as I became more familiar with your work um, and with you, I noticed a few things right off the bat. And the first was your sheer courage <laughs> and determination to go up against the scientific dogma especially the standard model of quantum physics, and yet to do so in a really grounded way that was, you know, working with all the math, the geometry, the physics, and so forth. And the second uh, thing that really stood out to me about you was that you actually reminded me of a modern-day Einstein uh, in that you, your ideas were so much more intuitive and uh, visual, spatially you have this visual spatial ability to imagine what reality might be like from the smallest particles perspective. And yet also like Einstein, you started off as a bit of an outsider, uh, trying to bring new theories into the academic establishment of physics, which I know is no easy task. So you've really been a pioneer in this field. And I just love how you bring that solid foundation, that practical yet elegant ways to unite science with uh, also drawing in sacred geometry, mystical teachings, and more. And I am so looking forward to our conversation today. I want to thank you for being my guest on Quantum Minds TV. Thank you. It's so great to be here with you. And what a journey since 2009, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, you've, you know, you've really made some amazing headway. And um, so in our conversation today, you know, of course, we both really are very interested in quantum physics and science and, you know, cosmology and all these types of things. So we're going to dive pretty deep into uh, some, some heavy topics today. But what I'd like to do is find a way where we can uh, talk about them for also for the lay person uh, so that we can help them really make that bridge and understand, you know, these very complex and abstract ideas in a way that is relatable. Um, and one of my favorite things is to try and tie quantum physics together with how it relates to us in our lives today so that we can, um, so that we can, you know, own it, so that we can shift our consciousness. And, you know, of course we can use quantum principles and, and have them apply to our mindset. But your area of specialization really has been also in how it applies in more concrete ways in the practical world and with technology and so forth. And, uh, you know, so one of my first things, I don't know if you're, you know, if you're happy to go this far back, but um, one of my first exposures to your work was really around what might be called um, torsion physics, where you propose like the center of atoms uh, might not be particles per se, as much as mini black holes. Uh, and so, you know, where are you with this idea? And maybe you can explain a little bit of that for the lay person who's not as familiar with your work. Yeah, um, there's so many 
parts. I, I think one of the one of the things um, that you mentioned uh, in what you were talking about is how quantum physics relates to our life, our daily life. And I, I think one of the big problems that happens is that we have a tendency to put things in boxes mm -hmm. and then, you know, say, oh, well, that's quantum physics, that's relativistic physics, this is this, this is that. But what really we're talking about is the physics of creation, like how existence actually occur. And since we're part of it, of, you know, of uh, existence, it's kind of critical to our life to understand what, you know, I always wonder when I was a kid, like, you know, why, like people get here and all of a sudden they're aware, they're conscious, they see the universe around them, but they don't commonly ask, how did I get here? And how did this whole thing happen? Right. Uh, until maybe the last few minutes of their, lives or the few hours before at the end of their life where they start wondering what was this all about right <laughs> um and so um but but yeah the, the so so from early on i start to investigate you know what what this reality we live in what we are how this whole happened and and i ran into a problem a, a very Early on, I ran into a problem of of dimension, of you know measurement problem that mm -hmm. that um you can where do you stop dividing stuff? Like you can divide things to like you can get smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, uh, already a proton is really small, right? Even a cell, a biological cell, is really small. You're made a hundred like between 50 and 100 uh, trillion cells you know that's a lot of cells so they're pretty small and then each is made 100 trillion atoms you know and all this stuff is really really small and then a proton is like very very small beady center of the atom um and uh and then and that's dividable into eventually plonks you know and so on and so when I was thinking about this, I, I thought, well, you know, just as the largest, like, why would the universe stop at the universe? Why wouldn't our universe be in a larger one that would be in a larger one? And I had this, you know, fractal infinity problem. And, and it started to, I started to realize that maybe we're just experiencing one scale, like a, a, a harmonics of scales mm -hmm. in the universe or like mm -hmm. or, or in the multiverse if you'd like and that like so that you could divide the the atom into smaller and smaller pieces to, to infinity and if you could that would mean that the atom is actually akin to a black hole it's it's got infinite potential in it right it has infinite energy infinite power and so and so that what we see of the atom is like just a very small amount of the energy that's present in it mm -hmm. you know like if you look at a black hole you don't see much energy right but there's a lot in it because it's confined mm -hmm. right it's screened relative to you and you know the concept of screening is already in quantum mechanics and all this stuff but um so it it started to come together as i was uh investigating and then eventually i wrote this paper that got me a lot of tomato throwing um <laughs> called the sword child proton and i called it that way because i was trying to be a little bit not too much in their face <laughs> um, because I could have called it the black hole proton, but the switch out solution is the black solution to Einstein field equation. So uh, I called it the switch out proton. And, and, and basically, I would, in that paper, the only thing I was trying to show that I showed in that paper is that if you make the proton a little black hole, the gravitational force of two protons together would be equivalent to what we call the strong force, which is 
the force that holds the nuclei of the atom together. Mm -hmm. that we don't know where it came from. We just called it the strong force. We give it a, a value. But in physics, we have no mechanical understanding of where that force comes from. Um, and so I, I, I basically showed that the error is in our understanding of mass, not, um, you know, and, and that's where, you know, um, I got in trouble because they said, well, if the black hole is a, if the proton is a black hole, it, would, it should have this huge mass and all this. And, you know, how is that possible? And I showed it's actually a holographic screening that's occurring. So we're not actually experiencing the, you know, mass is, mass is a concept in physics that's not well defined. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's a big issue. And that's why, you know, Higgs mechanisms were invented and, you know, the Higgs particles were tried to be found in accelerators to try to find a source to mass. Basically, it's a, and we know mass is equivalent to energy since Einstein, right? E equals MC square. Well, you know, that means what is the energy and where is it coming from? Well, and that really brings us to the whole notion of the quantum vacuum and how, you know, this infinite potential energy is stored within that quantum vacuum, that quantum field. And, and that not only does that reside within the, you know, the inner core of, of every particle, for example, that could, you know, create like black hole type effect. But that's within every every atom of our body. Like this quantum field resides within all of us, and and we also see that the quantum field uh, and quantum effects. You know, they're not just for the micro or the nano or the Planck scale, but the smallest of scales anymore. These uh, quantum effects, we can see that they go all the way out into the, the cosmic structure of the universe itself. So. We live in a quantum universe, not a classical universe. And when it comes to us, you know, we need to start looking at ourselves as quantum beings. And one of the things that um, I've actually come across, which relates to some of the work actually of Dr. Emoto, what he, you know, a lot of people know about him through his water crystals. Um, but what he was really trying to identify was he was trying to find a visual way in which um, something he called Hado. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Nassim. It's called H-A-D-O, Hado. In Japan, there is this kind of concept of Hado energy. It's like the essence of the energy itself that is emitted from the very core of an atom. And it's emitted out as these sort of waves or these essence um, and he was trying to find a way that we could extract or draw out that essence. And this is then where he decided, okay, water might be the best uh, substance to work with. And let's see if our consciousness can actually dip in to that hado, that essence uh, within the water and draw it out and, and maybe even influence it. And uh, so he, he proposed in some of his other works that, Hado is literally the um, waves of atomic energy or even subatomic energy that come off from what I would call quantum fluctuations. Uh, and, and one wonders if this essence, this Hado, might actually be what we could consider chi or the vital life force essence that animates everything, not just us, but everything that has particles and, and matter and, and so forth, uh, you know, or even just any access to the quantum field, which would then say that, that every little micro, you know, space is alive and teeming with this vital life force essence that is quantum fluctuation. Uh, and, and so that, I think, really ties into some of what you were doing, where it's like you're, you're talking about the space not the particles themselves necessarily, but the space between the empty space within the atom and how much energy is there. Is that correct? Exactly. You know, I mean, to for your listeners, when we're talking about vacuum, quantum vacuum fluctuation or quantum energy, uh, uh, vacuum energy, or when we're talking about zero-point energy, was called that way by Einstein uh, as well. 
um, you know, we're talking about the fact that in quantum field theory, um, space is not empty. It's full of energy. Um, and people have a hard time relating to that, but really it's kind of obvious because like, you know, the space between you and I, well, we're far from each other, but the space between things we know is not empty, right? It's full of electromagnetic fields. You know, there's background microwave from, from the big bang, even like from the universe, there's like background radiation from the galaxy in the space around you. There's, there's, uh, Wi-Fi, there's, um, you know, Bluetooth, there's, uh, there's all kinds of stuff. And, um, and uh, so there's all kinds of wavelength of electromagnetic fields, like there's radio waves, right, that are very long and all this, but then there's shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter wavelength. And when you write the equations for quantum physics, when you get to the level of like, particle and subatomic particle and the Planck scale, you find that there's like really, really short wavelengths of electromagnetic fluctuation where basically the wavelength is becomes the length that a photon would go through if it was going at the speed of light. So that defines the Planck units, right? And when you calculate how much of that there is in a centimeter cube of quantum space, it's non-trivial. It's huge. It's 10 to the 93 to 10 to 94 grams per centimeter cube, right? Because you can convert energy into mass or into grams, right? And so that's that's more than the mass of the universe in a centimeter cube of space by 39 orders of magnitude. It's non-trivial. And now, let's enjoy this short consciousness break featuring the amazing research of Nassim Haramine and the Resonance Science Foundation. I, I believe that there's a quote, I don't remember if it's Niels Bohr, you know, but some of those founders of quantum physics that did the calculation from a theoretical perspective of if we took just the space of a light bulb and how much empty space, you know, the quantum vacuum was in there and we calculated the potential energy within that, that space of the light bulb, it was enough energy to boil all the world's oceans. 
I believe is is the quote. Right. I mean, that's a lot, right? So if we could find ways to tap in and, and extract that essence of the quantum vacuum, now we've got a whole new a whole new revolutionary way to, to power everything in our in our lives. Yeah, and basically what I've done is that I've just shown that that energy is the source of mass, charge, electromagnetic field, of particles. It's the source of reality as a whole, right? So then it, it links nicely to many ancient civilization, right, that had these concepts in it, like you were discussing in Japan, for instance, or you find from Maya culture to Enka culture to Vedic cultures all around the world, these ancient uh, uh, knowledge base described all of them, described, you know, they called it a different way, but they described this fundamental field of energy and uh, that was the source of everything. And, and then eventually you find, you know, in modern physics, you find Maxwell's equation that emerged in which Maxwell was trying to describe the electromagnetic field and he needed the electromagnetic waves to ride on something in his equation. So he described a uh, luminous, luminiferous ether, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and the ether was part of physics for a long time. And then you know, and, and then there was some experiments that didn't detect an ether, um, but these experiments were not, were interpreted a little bit incorrectly, meaning, you know, the way they were done, they wouldn't have, they eliminated it, an ether that would drag very close to the surface of our planet, but they didn't eliminate an ether that would that would drag a long ways away. That is, the ether could be co-moving with our planet, mm -hmm. right? And then drag further on, which actually re-emerged in Einstein field equations later. But th that's why Einstein was inspired by, by Maxwell's um, lumif luminiferous ether, but he he um, he felt because of the experiment that his equation and his papers would never get published um, after those experiments. So if he called it an ether, so he called it space time, he used a different formalism <laughs> so that it could be a conceptual thing. <laughs> like if, you know, it's really remarkable. It's really remarkable to me <laughs> that like you can have a space time that produce gravity right a force that we experience every day right yeah. and and it's clearly there right it pulls things together it's non-trivial it pulls the planets to the sun it pulls the sun into the galaxy i mean it, it does the job right and to think that it's you know in general relativity is described as the structure of space curving Right, yeah. like you put the ball on a trampoline, it makes a curve, and another ball along, you know, would like curve towards, like it would roll towards the middle. Well, you know, if if it has physical effects like that, how can it just be space time, some yeah. kind of like esoteric, you know, module like model of yeah, space? Facts. Yeah, yeah. That that has no physical reality right so clearly after after 10 years einstein reversed his opinion einstein publicly said no 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 i general relativity is invalid without an ether we got to put it back in you know? <laughs> and but they didn't listen to him well, and so I since then physics is written without a field mm -hmm. and this is why mm -hmm. uh you know, there's been a big problem in physics in trying to get to the foundation of things. Mm. I love that you brought all that up because um, I remember in in my own studies as, you know, in attaining my PhD in physics, one of the experiments that I actually did some some uh, reporting on and, and, you know, was the Michelson-Morley, you know, experiment where they were trying to test for the ether. But I agree with you that they were coming from a very mechanical mindset where they were thinking of the ether as if it were a medium like 
water or like air that light had to travel through and therefore there must be some kind of yeah, friction or drag. Um, but what they didn't realize is that the ether was like a super fluid. There would be no friction. There would be no resistance. There would even there wouldn't even be limitations in space and time. And what I love is that, you know, so Einstein, he had his cosmological constant as part of his equations, but then he didn't know where it came from. And he kind of felt like it was a little bit of hand waving. And then he kind of called it his biggest mistake. Right. But now today, scientists are coming back around to this idea of the cosmological constant. They're even calling it the ether um, that they that this uh, and they're now they're so dark energy. Yeah, with dark energy, which is the reason that, you know, they, they, they're measuring that the universe is expanding at an accelerated rate, which means there has to be some kind of force that's coming in and pushing it to be accelerating in its expansion. And they don't know, they can't measure directly what this is. So they're calling it a dark energy. They can see its effect, but they can't measure it directly. So they're calling it dark energy, but some theories are coming back around to this idea that that cosmological constant was actually uh, the the force of the ether, but it's coming out uniformly from every little point in space. Uh, and and you know if if I can just tie that right back into some of the ancient mystical teachings. Uh, so like I come from the, the tradition of Hermetics and universal Kabbalistic teachings and alchemy. Um, we would talk about the force of the, the, the source, the divine will coming in through every point in space, through that quantum vacuum into our universe and pushing its will out. So it's like there is this will to expand the light, the, the universe of life and creation. And um, in alchemy, they would maybe call it prima materia, you know, that there was this, this ether. And uh, even Tesla talked about the ether, this luminiferous ether uh, that pervades the universe and, and that that is really the true essence of what we're searching for. So how, Nassim, how have you been working with uh, trying to tap into some of this, what we could call zero point energy or this ether energy uh, that comes out from the quantum vacuum? Well, the cool thing is that you know, although Einstein tried to eliminate it with space time, um, you know, space because you can't really eliminate it, right? Because <laughs> we're in it and we're made of it. Um, and if you write your equation, even if they're incorrect, like com not complete, it, you know, you'll get something along those lines. You get an Einstein field equation, you get frame dragging. Right. And and so, you know, that sounds a lot like the ether dragging, you know, and 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 that's being measured. So, for instance, we we sent disco balls into orbit and then we we bounce a, a laser beam to the yeah, disco. Right? Ball. We want to have a uh, cosmic disco dance. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Out in, out in uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. With the galactic community. And uh and the, and when the beam comes back, we can see it's dragged that the disco ball is dragging behind. And um, you know, we've had so that was the first experiments. Then we have gravity probe B that showed with gyroscope in in uh, in orbit that like there is a drag and all this. So, but but because it was like almost a hundred years after the ether was not put back in, so. It wasn't, and so basically, I solved all this um, by showing that what we called earlier the ether is, I mean, on Einstein's side, it shows up that way, I just told you, but on, on the quantum side, and quantum theory, it shows up as vacuum fluctuation we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. It's clearly there. And, and, and that's very successful. So basically, you know, I, I found how they connect and they connect, um, because of the relationship of va the vacuum fluctuation at the quantum level, mass, charge, electromagnetic fields, and how they apply when you grow the system, you know, 
when you scale the equations to larger objects like planets, stars, galaxies, universes. And, and when you do, you get the right answers, meaning you, you make the equation for the proton, which I did, and I, I was able to predict a, a radius for the proton. I did that in 2012. Mm-hmm. And then it like was crazy because it was 4% smaller than the standard radius. And 4% in quantum physics for like a fundamental constant, like the proton mm-hmm. radius, is that's insane. Because yeah. usually things are measured with like 10 to the minus 10, you know, 10. Precision, sh- yeah, precision art. <laughs> Precision mm-hmm. after the yeah. period. So like 4%, you're not even in the ballpark. You're like... You're not even within the, wow. the, the the error range, you know, the standard deviations, right? Right. It's huge, right? I don't know how many sigma... I mean, yeah, I mean, it's seven or eight sigma, you know, 4%. Mm-hmm. So I was like... But um, but all my... all It was giving me the gravitational coupling constants. It was giving me the correct mass. It was So I was like... It can't be wrong. So I predicted it. And uh, in 2013, they measured the radius, the proton more precisely, and they came up 4% short. And they were like, oh, my God, it's like because it breaks the standard model of physics. So they were like, oh, no, you know, so they many physicists kind of said, oh, it doesn't matter. It's it's an error of measurement. They mm-hmm. measured it again and again. And by 2000. Uh, 18 they measured it not with muons like at first but with electrons and you know they when they did that um they realized well you know what had gone wrong was the uh, corrections from the standard model of physics when they were calculating the measurement they removed that and they got the correct radius at four percent smaller and that's why now it's the codata value you know in 2018 they changed the codata value of the radius to proton to the one i predicted um you know and i'm inside one sigma so that means i'm inside i'm still today inside the resolution of the experiments with my value so um, so those are very powerful, you know, confirmation, very, very powerful confirmation. But as I did all that, it really kind of like, you know, put all the pieces together. Like I, as I, I showed basically that basically there's only one thing, basically, Teresa, <laughs> it's that field. And when mm-hmm. it spins, mm-hmm. it makes vortices. They're called quantum vortices, and these vortices have properties, energetic properties that we call mass Mm. and charge and electromagnetic fields. Mm. And so everything emerged from the spin of the turbulence of the vacuum structure, the Mm. information flow of this information field, you could call it, like you can... Think of it as like a field of information that's transferring information across scales. Right. And it, and and so so then it's a no-brainer. And I've solved these equations now. I'm about to publish it. It's almost 200 pages. It's really complex. So I've, <laughs> I know I've been saying I'm about to publish it for five years. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I understand this. So this is the magnum opus that you're working on. I mean, you've got some major smoking guns. you got to get it right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's really good. It outputs all of the constants of physics with 12-digit accuracy. It it uh, predicts all the scales. It, it's so beautiful. I Alpha comes out naturally, like alpha is not this mysterious number anymore. It comes out naturally and all all this. And so, and so it's a straight up, like, you know, owner's manual to Mm -hmm. how to get energy from the structure of the vacuum, how to control gravitational field, how to cross the galaxy, how to go from one universe to another i mean it's straight up gives you the mechanics uh of how things work and how you can interact with them so that your society is not struggling to extract resources to try to function in the universe yeah wow 
Oh, you just said so much there. <laughs> and I think for some people, it's going to be like, whoosh, that was way over my head, but it sounds cool. But I'd like to, I'd like to <laughs> unpack some of it a bit for, for people to hopefully maybe understand. Um, so if I may, the, the standard model of quantum physics has been like the mainstay of, of physics for at least the last hundred years. And it, you know, it, it organizes, the, these are the fundamental particles. Everything is made of these particles. They have this mass, this energy, this charge. And, you know, they've got a few charts. Different from like the old periodic charts of, of the elements, now you have the charts of the fundamental particles. Um, and, and, you know, the, the laws that govern uh, the, the four forces of strong force, weak force, electromagnetic force, and gravity. And quantum physics has actually managed in a standard model to unify three out of those four forces. So they've unified the strong nuclear force, which is said to bind the quarks together inside of a proton. They've unified uh, the weak force, which is said to govern, you know, like neutrinos and, and electron uh, kind of interactions and uh, nuclear fission. And then they've also unified electromagnetic force, which governs charged particles and photons. And so they've been able to unify these three forces in quantum physics, but gravity has always stayed um, kind of, they, they meet infinities when they try to bring uh, like the quantum size stuff, which is usually at micro, you know, really small Planck scale levels, and then scale that up to large masses, like, you know, and, and large sizes, like you find in the, the universe. And gravity is, you know, what governs those, those large bodies. But what Einstein came forward with was that it's not gravity really is not the force. It's the space time and space time is bent. Matter tells space time how to bend uh, or how to, how to, you know, kind of fold. And then matter or energy. Yeah. And then space time uh, tells matter how to move. And so they, these two kind of work together. Like you often see that, that idea of a, a, of a fabric, and then you put a ball on the fabric and it kind of bends the fabric. So this is, you know, the, the general relativity, the basics of it. Um, and so quantum physics uh, or science today is really searching for a way to unite uh, quantum principles with the gravitational or with the general relativity. Uh, general relativity is based more on old classical physics versus quantum physics. And so where they come together though is when you have things like a black hole or you come to these really you know dense uh mass or energy levels at quantum scales and so this is something that you know is it, this grand unified theory is is one of the biggest searches in quantum or just in physics and science today which is one of these areas that nasim has made major groundbreaking discoveries on uh, and, and and so, you know, when we come back to the constants that you were talking about, Nassim, the constants in when I was going through my education, the constants, there was a certain number of constants, 20 something fundamental constants. And science didn't know where they came from. They just knew what they were. They knew the value and they would measure that value and they'd say, well, this is what it is. This is the mass of the, of the electron. This is the a coupling constant for, you know, electrons interacting with photons, for example, or charged particles interacting. Uh, this is the cosmological structure, but we don't know where it is. We just know what it is, right? We know its value. So to come to a place where you can actually derive those fundamental constants from first principles and say, I have a theory uh, and, a, and, a, and a, you know, formula of how we can unify gravity with quantum physics. And also it emerges out of the equations, these fundamental constants from first principles level. I mean, that is, as far as I can tell in physics, that is a smoking gun because that is now bringing a unification and, and a simplification. But, but the key here, I think, is that it reintroduces this notion of the quantum vacuum, it's not zero, we can't ignore it. The ether, you know, it's there. And this is the essence, like this is the source that everything else is built upon. And, and even 
quantum physicists today are saying, yeah, the the quantum vacuum is highly entangled. It's the glue that holds space time together. It's, you know, th this is everything is ultimately from that quantum fluctuation, but they're kind of still not quite sure how to put the pieces together. And this is what you're doing. Uh, so right. it's from exactly. Vacuum. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, so they are getting to it very, very like you, you think of, um, Sutskin and, and, um, and uh, Frank Wilczek and others are getting really close to it. It's just that the pieces um, are, are not, you know, they're not arranged to go together easily. The formalism of how the math was written for these pieces is discontinued. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not connected. So, um, so, so um, how, how does it connect? It turns out is basically by uh, actually understanding the the fluid dynamics of that superfluid space time structure, and when you when you put it in that context, all of a sudden um, you get like a literal fluid mechanics model. And out of these fluid mechanics, like you were saying, these constants appear, meaning like the radius, the proton, the radius, the electron, the mass, the proton, the price, the Rydberg constant. Oh, if they have these mass and they have these radiuses, then they, you know, the right the value for the for the charge interaction will be the Rydberg constant. All of a sudden, you know, and and Remarkably, you know, as you're continuing the model and continuing to write these things, all of a sudden you go, "Oh wow! Look, I, from the Rydberg constant, I you output g, the gravitational constant, for the first time, like <laughs> an analytical solution to g. So all of a sudden you have g with twelve-digit accuracy, which you didn't have before. G is only measured." The gravitational constant is only measured to 10 to the minus 5, approximately 5, because, I mean, it's very hard to measure. We have the Cavendish experiments and stuff like that. But And so, and so now, you, now you get the relationship between these things. And you know what's the most buggling, most... I can't say too much because it's not published, <laughs> but I is that when you start to look at the relationship, because at one point... With Dr. Olivier Allerol, I was trying to keep all these equations in mind and all these relationships. I was kind of losing my mind, so I, <laughs> I, I said, "Let's, <laughs> yeah." So I said, "Let's, uh, let's draw a, you know, a kind of a graphic of like how things should be connected," and um, and so we start to draw that. And I'm not gonna say which one, but. What came out, and, and Olivier is not trained in any way in esoteric, esoteric knowledge like you and I. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he had no idea. So he was just drawing the relationship, the mathematical relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Not just like, um, not just, you know, conceptually, but actually how the mathematics connects these things. And as he did, I'm looking at him like, it's it turns out to be a very important ancient secret you know uh uh a symbol that that's that's well known in ancient uh esoteric oh, no, uh, is you this... can't leave me hanging like that <laughs> <laughs> this conscious conversation was created produced and recorded by dr teresa bullard wyke in collaboration with Nassim Haramon and edited by Verse Content and HH Films and Photo. The theme music and intro videography were created by Tim Mountain of Evenload Productions. Quantum Minds TV is a product of the Quantum Learning Academy.